Well, this is actually representing about a 50 times jump in the quality and the performance for the graphics and the animation. And that is a bigger leap in one generation than ever before in the history of consumer electronics. Before the Sony PlayStation or Sega Saturn, the 3DO arrived to the home console market in 1993 and along with it came the promise of the next generation of gaming and a home multimedia machine. Films like Jurassic Park and arcade games like Virtua Fighter had whet the public's appetite for CGI, but home consoles like the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis, even with their various add-ons and custom cartridge chips, couldn't fully deliver what the public wanted. The 3DO was supposed to change all of that. The 3DO was planned to be both more powerful and cheaper than a PC, with texture mapping capabilities, a double speed CD-ROM, a modem, and a multitasking operating system, the 3DO really did seem like the next big thing, and many agreed. It was covered in mainstream newspapers, featured on major morning and financial TV shows, it was one of the darlings of CES in 1992 and 1993, and was Time Magazine's 1993 Product of the Year. So. Where did it all go wrong? Why aren't we in what should be the middle of a 3DO force production cycle? To find out, we're going to look at how the founder of EA teamed with the co-creators of the original Amiga computer and Atari Lynx to create one of the most anticipated pieces of gaming hardware from the 90s, only to see it fail to capture the market that seemed to covet it. This is the story of the 3DO. What time will my daughter be home? The passive type probably plays Nintendo. What time will my daughter be home? Somewhere between 10 and 2. The aggressive type probably plays Sega. What time will my daughter be home? You want her back? And the other type definitely plays 3DO, the most advanced home gaming system in the universe. The 3DO Interactive Multiplayer, or simply the 3DO as it's more commonly known, was a product of the 3DO company, which was founded in 1991 by Trip Hawkins. Hawkins himself is an important figure in the video game industry, and whether you know who he is or not, chances are that Trip has impacted or shaped some of your gaming experiences. Back in 1982, well before he became the founder of the 3DO company, he started another little company you may have heard of, Electronic Arts. The, uh, the area where the greatest challenges will come in is is in looking for original ideas and new creative ways to break the mold. I mean, a lot of people uh, look at what other people have done and try to do something that's a spin-off from that, but the, the really creative geniuses in the industry are capable of coming up with something completely new. Tripp was a forward thinker and a meticulous planner. According to Tripp, while working for a computer think tank in 1975, he calculated that 1982 would be the year in which there would be enough people with a computer in their home to sell games to. EA flourished for years under Tripp's leadership, and he remained on EA's board when he left to form the 3DO company. While Tripp was the face and mastermind behind the 3DO's brand, the hardware and software was designed by David Needle and Robert R.J. McCall. Before working on the 3DO, David and R.J. had already been collaborating together for years, most famously on the Amiga 1000 and the Atari Lynx. Already best friends for nearly a decade, the pair complemented each other well. Needle would design microprocessors and other hardware while RJ would write system software. Despite being technologically innovative, the Atari Lynx never achieved the commercial success of the Game Boy or the Sega Game Gear, and by September of 1991, David and RJ were already working on creating the next big thing. The two former Amiga designers met with ex-Amiga president David Morse at a restaurant and designed the basics of what would eventually become the 3DO on a napkin. The trio formed New Technologies Group and began working on developing their newest project and fundraising. David Needle and RJ McCall put together a prototype in RJ's home office to showcase the unit's capabilities, one frame at a time. David and RJ showed their demo to various people in the video game industry, including Trip Hawkins. Trip Hawkins knew David and RJ since the duo's early days at Amiga. Tripp's electronic arts had been an early supporter of Amiga, and on a personal level, Tripp felt the three were kindred spirits. Reflecting back on his meeting with David and RJ, Tripp said, They'd made some very important decisions. They were the same decisions that I would have made, rather than me start a brand new team and starting from scratch. It just made a lot of sense to me to try and join forces with them and shape what they were doing into what I wanted it to be. Tripp Hopkins, 2013. Tripp had been looking to create a true next generation system for some time, and this seemed like the perfect opportunity. New Technologies Group became part of Trip Hawkins' newly created 3DO company, and having helped establish the corporate base that technology would need to survive, 
David Morse moved on to other ventures. During the 1992 CES, the 3DO was revealed to the press and public. Afterwards, everyone seemed to want a piece of it. The 3DO received coverage in the business sections of mainstream newspapers like the New York Times and Chicago Tribune. It was profiled by Time Magazine, Newsweek, and US News. CNN and CNBC aired segments, and the following year, Trip Hawkins was offered the keynote speech at 1993's summer CES, allegedly besting Bill Gates, who had requested that honor. Bankers and other investors were also eager to invest. This is a concept sale. It hasn't happened yet. It looks like it's coming together. It might fail. They can be perfectly honest and open about it and say, might not work, guys. And people are still just writing checks like that. It's the latest public offering to take Wall Street by storm. A look inside the dynamics of 3DO, a Bay Area multimedia... The 3DO was coming, and the press, public, and video game industry all seemed to agree that it was going to be a big deal. Trip had no desire for the 3DO company to manufacture their own consoles. Instead, the console specifications designed by David and RJ would be licensed to hardware manufacturers. In turn, 3DO would receive royalties on each console sold. The 3DO company would also receive a $3 royalty for each game that was sold. 3DO's $3 royalty was significantly lower than the royalties developers and publishers had to pay to Sega and Nintendo, and helped to eventually attract more than 300 officially licensed developers by late 1993, though not all of those would go on to release 3DO games. Trip and the 3DO company met with a number of potential manufacturers, but the two they wanted the most were Sony and Panasonic, the two largest consumer electronic companies in the world at the time. When 3DO approached Sony, they were already in the midst of development for the Sony PlayStation. However, the 3DO was quite a bit ahead of them in terms of development. Sony had a choice between coming to the market sooner as a 3DO manufacturer or waiting until they could bring their own product to the marketplace. Sony, as we all know, chose to wait. In the end, it would be Panasonic who would build and release the first 3DO console. In March of 1993, months before they would even release a console for sale, the 3DO company entered the stock market and its initial public offering valued the company at over $59 million. Seven months later and approximately four years after being designed on a paper napkin in a restaurant, the 3DO was finally here and it was real. The real 3DO interactive multiplayer from Panasonic with the hottest CD games on Earth. Welcome to the real world. Panasonic's FZ1 Real 3DO Interactive Multiplayer was the first 3DO machine to hit the market when it was released in the United States in October of 1993 for $699. Jurassic Park Interactive was supposed to be included as the launch title, but it, like several of the 3DO's initial titles, suffered from delays in development. Crash and Burn, a game developed by Crystal Dynamics, a company that conveniently enough was co-founded by David Morse, replaced Jurassic Park Interactive as the 3DO's big launch title. While it may not have had the brand recognition of Jurassic Park, Crash and Burn was positively reviewed by most critics, with GamePro going as far as to say that it had the most outrageous graphics you've ever seen on a home system. In recent years, the 3DO has been somewhat lumped in with the CDI and is often thought of as a console that relied heavily on interactive movies or full motion video games. Someone's receiving. This is Ursula Sky, commander of Colonial Star One. We are under attack. Repeat, under attack. My ship has been overrun by the Black Brigade. Captain Talon is in control of the Star Splitter Cannon. They're beaming colonists aboard the Black Dragon is hostile. And while it did have its fair share of FMV titles, the 3DO actually had a fairly large library of games, many of which were considered to be quite good. The 3DO played host to standout titles such as Road Rash, Slayer, Killing Time, Star Control 2, and its best-selling game, Gex, to name a few. It was also the home of some very strong ports of Alone in the Dark, Samurai Showdown, Wing Commander 3, and Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo. The 3DO's ability to run high-quality games wasn't a shock to anyone. If anything, it was expected. At the time, the 3DO was considered quite powerful for a home console. Under its hood, 
The 3DO packed a 12.5 MHz 32-bit CPU, 2 MB of RAM, 1 MB of video RAM, support for Dolby surround sound, and was capable of up to a 640 by 480 resolution. The 3DO featured two video processors designed by David Needle. The twin GPUs handled drawing the image, which then left the CPU and a math coprocessor free to concentrate on calculating positions, resulting in very fast, real-time polygons being generated. The 3DO had all the makings of a successful launch. Trip Hawkins and his company had created a buzz. They were armed with a massive advertising campaign and a powerful console. Dozens of manufacturers and hundreds of developers had signed on to make 3DO hardware and software, and there were going to be numerous titles available at launch. Electronic Arts even took out two-page ads in magazines, heralding the 3DO as the next big technological leap in gaming and promising to deliver 20 new 3DO titles over the next 12 months. Unfortunately, the 3DO's launch didn't go quite as expected. As well as Crash and Burn may have been received by fans and critics, it simply wasn't enough to make up for the fact that when the 3DO launched, it ended up being the only game that was available. According to Electronic Gaming Monthly, this was due to 3DO making changes to the hardware practically up to the launch date, which in turn didn't leave developers enough time to fully complete or test their games by the console's launch date. This may also help to explain why there was a shortage of consoles available for sale at launch, with some stores only receiving one or two units. By the time the 3DO was actually released, some of the fervor and anticipation for it had waned. And with an eye to the future, tomorrow begins today. Nintendo, the world's leader in video games, has joined forces with Silicon Graphics, the world's leader in visual computing, to introduce the most exhilarating, breathtakingly realistic 3D video entertainment ever witnessed. Project Reality. Though none would be available anytime soon, Nintendo's Project Reality, which would become the N64, Sega Saturn and Sony PlayStation were all already announced prior to the 3DO going on sale, and the Atari Jaguar, a system that was marketed as a 64-bit machine, was set to be released just one month after the 32-bit 3DO. These announcements from established console manufacturers, combined with the 3DO's inability to deliver more than one title at launch, gave many consumers reservations about spending $699 on a new and untested brand. A few more titles appeared the following month, but by early 1994, just a few months after its launch, the 3DO was already in trouble. Trip Hawkins knew that changes needed to be made, and fast. Hi, I'm Trip Hawkins. I'd like to tell you why 3DO is going to be the biggest product in your store since the VCR. Trip knew that the 3DO's $699 price tag was a big deterrent to the average consumer. Most console manufacturers, such as Sega and Nintendo, often sold their consoles at a loss, knowing that they would later make up the loss through the high royalties they would receive from each licensed game that was sold. Tripp's decision to license out the manufacturing of the console to other companies allowed 3DO to set the royalty rate at a low $3 per game, which in turn attracted hundreds of developers. Unfortunately, it also meant that 3DO's console manufacturers wouldn't collect any money from game publishers, and they themselves, owing royalties to the 3DO company, had to sell their machines at a price that allowed them to make a profit. This resulted in high prices and low sales for 3DO consoles. To help solve this problem, Trip Hawkins has said that he worked out a deal with Panasonic to reduce the price of their console. While Panasonic attributed the reduction in price to chip integration and a reduction of parts cost. Whatever the reason for it may have been, in April of 1994, the price of Panasonic's FZ1 3DO was reduced to $499. Later that year, Goldstar released their version of the 3DO for $399, matching the upcoming launch price of the Sega Saturn. By the end of 1994, the 3DO was now over 40% cheaper than when it launched and had slowly but surely built a respectable library of games. Despite growing their library of titles and reducing the retail price of their consoles, 1994 was a difficult year for the 3DO company. In March of 1994, GamePro magazine covered the 3DO's falling stock market price, plummeting from $37 a share to $23 in December of 1993 going into 1994. When the 3DO company announced their financial figures for their April 1994 to March 1995 fiscal year, they reported that they had nearly tripled their revenue over the previous year. But even so, the company still operated at a loss to the tune of $46.3 million. Things only got worse, as 1995 delivered a vicious one-two punch to the 3DO. First, 
The Sega Saturn was released in North America in May of 1995. The 3DO's drop in price helped it to at least remain competitive and stave off some of the Saturn's impact, but September would deliver their biggest challenge yet. On September 9, 1995, the PlayStation was released in North America, and the PlayStation was only $299. 1995 could have been a banner year for the 3DO, with some of its best received and best selling games being released that year. Instead, as the year went on, both the Sony PlayStation and Sega Saturn continued gaining momentum over the 3DO, and developers had taken notice. Many 3DO games, some previously exclusive to the 3DO, were ported to the PlayStation, but the loss that hurt the most, particularly on a personal level, was EA's decision to back the PlayStation over the 3DO. I realized that EA was stabbing us in the back. They were not going to have any exclusive games on 3DO. They were all going to show up on PlayStation. If you're a developer and you know that Electronic Arts was really the place that 3DO got conceived and birthed, and that even Electronic Arts is moving to PlayStation, then that's what you're going to do. Trip Hopkins, 2013. The loss of exclusive titles was a huge blow. 3DO began making games themselves. Hawkins' 3DO company and EA, the company he originally founded, were now competitors, and as such, Trip Hawkins couldn't continue as chairman of both companies. Trip Hawkins left Electronic Arts. The 3DO company ended 1995 with two major developments. First, in December of 1995, Goldstar dropped the price of their 3DO to $199, taking a loss of over $100 on each unit sold. To offset the losses, Goldstar themselves entered the developer space but weren't very successful. Second, despite the 3DO's trouble, a successor named the 3DO M2 had been in development. Rather than have the console produced by multiple manufacturers, 3DO sold the exclusive manufacturing rights for the M2 to Matsushita, better known as Panasonic, in December of 1995. Through the sale of the rights of M2 Technologies, the 3DO finally turned a profit in the first quarter of 1996 with a net income of $1.2 million. This victory would be short-lived. The Sony PlayStation dominated 1996, and by the end of the year it was clear that the 3DO wouldn't be able to compete. In December of 1996, the 3DO company shut down all hardware development for both the 3DO and the M2. Going forward, the 3DO company would develop and publish games for the PC and other console manufacturers. The 3DO console was no more. 3DO's tenure as a game developer would only last seven years. In 2003, the company filed for bankruptcy, and the company's intellectual properties were sold to its former rivals. The 3DO was also released in Japan and Europe, but it didn't fare well enough in either region to save it from its demise. Trip Hawkins has said that looking back, he wishes he had stayed at EA, and if he could go back in time, he wouldn't launch the 3DO. Post 3DO, Trip Hawkins has stayed involved in the gaming industry. In 2003, he founded the mobile game company Digital Chocolate. In 2013, he launched a new startup, If You Can, aimed specifically at teaching kids about compassion and anti-bullying through gaming. And most recently, Trip Hawkins added Professor to his list of accomplishments when he joined University of California Santa Barbara as their Professor of Practice and Technology Management program in 2016. After the 3DO, RJ McCall worked in mobile and online gaming development until 2005, when he would go on to work for Sony creating development tools for the PlayStation 3 and Vita. RJ left Sony in 2011 and founded his own games company, Arjinx, and is also currently working on researching machine consciousness for Google. I wasn't able to find much information regarding David Needle's post-3DO work, but he did file for several patents on inventions he created or co-created, apparently while working for a company named Jovial Test Equipment. Unfortunately, David Needle passed away on February 20th, 2016. His contributions to the Amiga 1000, Atari Lynx, the 3DO, and the industry as a whole will not be forgotten. The 3DO was powerful, easy to develop for, and well supported. During its brief three year run, the 3DO had over 275 games released worldwide and sold 2 million units. Sadly, Trip's vision for a high end video game and multimedia console was ahead of its time, and the 3DO wasn't able to overcome its poorly handled launch and pricing quickly enough to gather the market share it would need to compete against Sony PlayStation. Despite being discontinued in 1996, Homebrew developers have taken to creating hacks, mods, and even entirely new games for the 3DO. The 3DO may no longer be in production, but its story 
continues. I'd like to thank Historic Nerd for providing the voice of Trip Hawkins in this episode. If you're into gaming retrospectives like myself or historical videos, movie reviews, I highly recommend you check out his channel. And if you'd like to help my little channel grow, please feel free to share this video on Reddit or other social media. But most importantly, thank you for watching.